Coming up, the five-time Olympic medalist. For now, I have to use it to the best of my ability. Simone Biles shares her journey to the podium. I was stronger than most of the girls, stronger than most of the boys, too, even. And where she gets the courage to soar. God knows that without those, you wouldn't be as strong as you were. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. President Trump is expected to come out with a new executive order on immigration very soon. In a few moments, we're going to take a look at what that could be with Jay Sekulow of the American Center for Law and Justice. Meanwhile, President Trump has made his choice for his new national security advisor, and it's a selection that's being widely praised by Republicans and Democrats, including even some former members of the Obama administration. Gary Lane brings us the story. President Trump will be joined at the White House by his new national security advisor, H.R. McMaster. He's a man of tremendous talent and tremendous experience. McMaster is an active duty Army Lieutenant General, a veteran of the Gulf War and Afghanistan, and commander of U.S. troops in Iraq. He's a soldier scholar who earned a Ph.D. in military history from the University of North Carolina. A military strategist, he wrote the popular book, Dereliction of Duty, a searing criticism of political decisions made during the Vietnam War, decisions which he believes should have been challenged by the U.S. generals executing the war. As national security advisor, he replaces Michael Flynn, who was fired from the job after misleading the vice president about his phone call with the Russian ambassador. McMaster will remain a member of the Army while he serves as National Security Advisor. What a privilege it is to be able to continue serving our nation. Both Republicans and Democrats praise Trump's choice, including John McCain, who has often been critical of Trump. The Arizona senator tweeted, McMaster is outstanding choice, man of genuine intellect, character, and ability. And on a key issue of national security, 30 days into the Trump presidency, the fight against ISIS is intensifying. Defense Secretary James Mattis has just returned from Baghdad, where he met to plot strategy with military officials and the Iraqi prime minister. I assure you we are going to stand by you through this fight. U.S. and coalition airstrikes are now helping Iraqi forces in the final battle to drive the Islamic State from western Mosul. And here at home, Another item of business for the president this week, immigration. He's expected to sign a new executive travel order, temporarily banning immigrants from seven countries with links to terrorism. They're the same countries as in his previous order. The president's initial travel ban was blocked by a federal judge and then upheld by a panel from the Ninth Circuit Court. The difference this time, the new order will reportedly include tighter language, but will be less restrictive. Green card holders and people with visas from those seven countries will be allowed into the United States, and Syrian refugees will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, Jay Sekulow of the American Center for Law and Justice is with us. And Jay, uh, what do you think, what major changes are they going to put in this order, do you know? I think there's going to be three. Uh, one is going to be the issue of visas and green card holders, those that have lawful status within the United States will be able to continue uh, to utilize their visas. That was a question that arose in the last executive order. It took a White House memorandum to clarify that, in fact, uh, visa holders and green card holders were not subject to the order. But that was a White House memorandum, and the Ninth Circuit said that memorandum is not binding like an administrative agency's determination, like an HHS memorandum, so to speak. So that will clarify that issue. Uh, the second issue, I think, from what I'm hearing is that the uh, Syrian refugee uh, ban, which or, or at least hiatus, if you want to call it that, uh, is going to be put back within the context of those seven countries. So they'll be under the same footing as the other seven countries, not an outright prohibition for an indefinite period. And the third thing, <clears throat> excuse me, Pat, and I think this is uh, also going to be significant. There's going to be a very clear start date here. We're going to know when this order goes into effect. That was pro part of the problem was people were in transit. So you're going to have a clear start date. Those were some of the recommendations that we made. Um, I haven't seen the order, but what I'm hearing from our, my sources is that uh, those kinds of changes will be in the order. And that should make it pretty much bulletproof for a challenge, although I do expect that there will be a challenge. Well, you helped draft it, right? I mean, 
Is that right? Well, we gave suggested language. Whether that's yeah. uh, in the order or not, we'll see. But uh, we gave okay. language that we thought <laughs> that if the case was to be challenged, that this was the kind of language you would want to have. And I, I suspect that some of that type of language, if not the verbatim language, but some of the similar context will be in there. It's uh, now been reviewed by White House Counsel, Office of Legal Counsel, the Justice Department. So I, I think it's, it's a positive development. Well, now, is he going to withdraw the other and then resubmit this? Is that the game? So yes, so this yeah. will supersede the existing order, which will then moot out the current litigation. So the Ninth Circuit case, which has already been stayed, in other words, it's not moving forward pending this. The Justice Department in a filing said that a new executive order is coming. It will supersede this one. So hold this case in abeyance. It will. Then this case will be dismissed as moot. I suspect Washington State and Minnesota will file another lawsuit and uh, we'll be back in court again. And we're going to be filing briefs in that as well. But it's going to make it a much more difficult challenge. Now, what the Ninth Circuit does, you and I have talked about this for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Who knows uh, what the Ninth Circuit will do in a situation like this. But at the end of the day, if it goes to the Supreme Court of the United States, I feel confident that we could see a unanimous victory. Well, couldn't he file in a different uh, jurisdiction to get out of the Ninth Circuit? Well, the problem is the, the groups that are challenging it are forum shopping. They know that their most likely success is in the Ninth Circuit and particularly with some district court judges out on the West Coast. So here the president is not in a position, the administration will, is not in a position to be the plaintiff. They'll be the defendant because the order will be challenged. Uh -oh. So that's how this will move forward. So they're, yeah. they're defendants in the suit rather than, the, than initiating Correct. a suit. Okay. Well, you, you believe, you know, they've c claimed this is a so-called Muslim ban, but these are the same nations that Obama targeted for uh, because they're, they're rife with terror. They didn't name Indonesia. Yeah, I mean, these are seven countries of origin with known terrorist concerns and where countries cannot verify the whereabouts or the identifications necessarily of the individual seeking access. Also, 85% of the Muslim world is not impacted by this. So to say this is a Muslim ban, this religion clause argument, which a, a, a district court in Virginia bought, is, is ridiculous. It's absurd. I'm, there's no question in my mind that at the Supreme Court of the United States, I've argued a lot of religion cases at the, at the court, as you know, through the American Center for Law and Justice, and there is no way that the court's going to find that this is a, a violation of the Establishment Clause, uh, for goodness sake. I mean, there's no way that could happen. So I think at the end here, as I do expect litigation, though, Pat, I think we need to be prepared. Our team's are already working on, on, on the Establishment Clause arguments and some of the other presidential authority arguments because I think that's going to happen. Well, will they expedite it to the Supreme Court? I mean, will, they, will the court reach down and pick it up from the Ninth Circuit, or will they stall I around? think if the court, if the Ninth Circuit declares the order unconstitutional, I think you will see an emergency stay taken to Justice Kennedy. He would probably refer it to the whole court. So you could literally be at the Supreme Court in three weeks. Oh, that fast. I think that's very possible okay. here. Yeah, and, it could be really fast. Well, it's tough, but that's the game, isn't it, that these guys are going to keep piling on lawsuits, everything Trump does that these guys, the left is going to challenge him is, and tie him up in the courts. Is that, is that the game they're going to play? That is. And in a situation like this, they've mobilized already. They've been through, they've had their practice run. This, this new executive order is going to make it much more difficult. But I, I can't imagine, even if it's just the seven countries of origin, which as you said, Pat, were under the Obama administration, I, Washington State's going to file a lawsuit. They pretty much hinted at it already. So I think the administration this time is prepared. Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, he's in place. Uh, you've got uh, more lawyers now in the Department of Justice, more lawyers in the Solicitor General's office. W outside groups like ours will be engaged. So we'll be able to defend, but, but this will be a much cleaner order to defend. And, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing this uh, put in operation successfully. Boy, well, it's just, but I mean, they can keep filing lawsuits till the cows come home. There's yep. no limit. Uh, Who's I think they need to opt. I think the administration, I think they're doing this, Pat. The administration needs to operate under the assumption that any major policy change, whether it's, it's this one on uh, immigration and refugee status and asylum, or whether it's going to be the repeal and replacement of Obamacare or any other regulatory matter, I think the administration needs to be prepared that the left is going to utilize the courts. Why? They don't have the House, they mm -hmm. don't have the Senate, and they don't have the White House. So they go to the third branch of government, the Article Three branch of government, the courts. That's where this is going to be battled out. Well, 
if you were doing it, which circuit would you rather be in? If they, they've got to get out of that Ninth Circuit, those people are so yeah, far. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wish somebody would bring the case in the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Yeah. Uh, that would be a, a better <laughs> run for us. Right. Uh, even the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, where Judge Gorsuch, are, uh, the nominee for the Supreme Court, is coming yeah. out of. There's a number of other circuits I'd rather be in than the Ninth. But Pat, I think we need to buckle on the seatbelt. I think it's Ninth Circuit. It's going to be in the Ninth Circuit. Okay. They're so, going to challenge this. On yeah. the West Coast, yes. And you think we're going to win it now with these uh, tweaks, these amendments? It's going to. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we win it at the. Obviously, I haven't seen the order yet, but I mean, assuming it comes out like I expect it to, I think we win at the Supreme Court. I'm, I'm not confident of a win at the Ninth Circuit because I think the court's just too politicized. They are making policy statements. But I think at the Supreme Court of the United States, frankly, I don't see how a judge, a justice at the Supreme Court could rule against the president if this is tightened up the way it's going to be. By the way, we recommended also that it's put in there very clearly clearly that any due process rights that mm -hmm. apply to citizens or apply to non-resident aliens or resident aliens would apply in this context. All that is doing is what the law already says, but again, making it very clear that the due process rights, when they, when they attach, will be recognized. Jay, Only when they attach. Stay with it, buddy. Thank you so much. God bless we'll you. It. Jay Sekulow, fighting for you, ladies and gentlemen. Interesting. It's a shame that we have to fight so hard to protect well, our borders, Pat. The thing that's so outrageous is some puny little district court judge would actually override the president of the United States and the United States Congress. It makes no sense at all that they would have such authority. I don't think the Constitution gives them such authority, but they arrogate the, that authority. Mm -hmm. And until they're challenged, nobody. But for a one little district court judge to say, I'm going to put an injunction on the entire nation, he didn't get elected to anything. It's absurd, outrageous. I can't believe there's not anything in the Constitution that gives the doesn't that gives the president the ability to override that, to veto that. Well, it's there, really. I mean, they can they can do it, but the only way you can do it is impeach the clown, or either that, or get him uh, yeah. uh, overturned at the Supreme Court. So you have to go through the judicial. Uh, but it takes, it's glacial, but Jay thinks it can be expedited. Mm. It goes up the line. Um, but uh, hey, by the way, I better retract that statement. And I'm, Your Honor, I'm not calling you a clown. I said it wrong. Please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but, uh, hey, but this guy was a, quote, Bush appointee, but just there's something about it that's inherently wrong. It, 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 it sticks in the craw of every uh, freedom-loving American. Wendy? Still ahead, she's the gymnast who led the final five to Olympic glory. But it wasn't an easy road to Rio. Simone Biles looks back at the trials that turned her into a champion. But first, the Iraq War vet who's now fighting for refugees in the halls of Congress. We've got to end these destructive regime change war policies and take a stand for peace. CBN News sits down with Hawaii Congressman Tulsi Gabbard next. Welcome back. We're here for the 700 Club. I'm with uh, our lovely co-hostess, uh, Wendy Griffith, and uh, we're having a great time and glad we've got something marvelous coming up. Well, while politicians have been debating the best way to handle a civil war in Syria, one member of Congress who served in the military in that region decided to go back to assess the situation firsthand. Our Abigail Robertson spoke with Representative Tulsi Gabbard to hear why she made this daring and controversial journey. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard is no stranger to war zones. The suffering of the Syrian people um, has been so great and has been weighing heavily upon my heart for a long time. An Iraq war veteran, Gabbard voluntarily deployed twice to the Middle East. Experiences that led her to head to Syria for a first-hand look at the situation. I wanted to go there personally. I wanted to 
uh, express in some small, minute way the love and the care uh, and the aloha spirit that the people of Hawaii share with um, the Syrian people, that the people of our country uh, have for the Syrian people. Since returning home, Congresswoman Gabbard has had a difficult time sharing what she witnessed overseas amidst intense scrutiny from colleagues in both parties. Rather than having this uh, substantive debate, uh, they are focusing on things that uh, are irrelevant uh, or even not true. They want to know who paid for the trip, although she insists the House Ethics Committee approved it and why she met with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. It was important to take the meeting with President Assad because whether people like it or not, he is the president of Syria. Uh, any possibility for negotiations to occur, any possibility for a pathway to peace is going to have to include a conversation with him. Fellow lawmakers disagree, saying they are disgusted by the meeting with a leader who is responsible for thousands of deaths of his own people. Gabbard told me she had not originally planned to speak with Assad, but she wasn't going to pass on the opportunity. We talked about uh, how we can um, collectively uh, try to bring stability back uh, to Syria, how refugees who have left Syria will be able to return home. We talked about the, the history of Syria as a pluralistic society. She thinks the U.S. should focus on eliminating ISIS and al-Qaeda, not President Assad. We've got to end these destructive regime change war policies and take a stand for peace. A Democrat, she criticized the Obama administration's strategy of arming rebel groups. Most people are not aware of the fact that really since 2011, our government has quietly been providing uh, weapons, money, intelligence, and other types of support, both directly and indirectly to armed militant groups who are uh, working with and allied with uh, terrorist groups like al-Qaeda in this effort to overthrow the Syrian government. Gabbard introduced the bipartisan Stop Arming Terrorists Act and became the first Democratic House member to meet with then-president-elect Donald Trump to discuss the Syrian conflict. I talked with him about the need for us to stop arming and supporting those working with terrorist groups in Syria, the need for us to end this regime change war that Congress has never approved, and that is counterproductive because it's actually working to strengthen groups like al-Qaeda and ISIS, who we are supposed to be focusing on defeating. But she calls his ban on refugees unacceptable. We should, as a country, uh, do what it takes to be able to help those uh, get out of the situation where they are experiencing a genocide. Uh, and that's where our refugee policy can and should be focused, to help those who are suffering, to help those who are uh, the direct targets of this genocide that is being um, executed by groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Many Syrian Christians don't want to leave the country, despite relentless attacks. Syria, for Christians, it's home. Reverend Harut's church was bombed four times, but through it all, They've continued to rebuild and keep both the school and church operating to serve as a refuge for the whole community. Persecution is caused by the militant factors, militant groups that they are targeting Christians so that uh, they will be uh, going out and they will be fleeing the country. Uh, it's not time to leave, it's time to stay. While in Aleppo, Gabbard met with another priest determined to stay, even though he says Syrian rebels blew up his more than 150-year-old church. Many people who came from all around the world, they asked me, how do you know that the gangs did this? And I said it very clearly, when you look to their weapons, you can know who exploded the church. According to the priest, the Syrian government has given them the resources to rebuild the church. CBN News international correspondent Gary Lane has visited Syria and spoken to Christians who prefer Assad over the extremists. Syrian Christians won't state publicly how they feel about the Assad regime because they fear retribution, but privately they'll tell you that they fared pretty well under Assad. They've been free to worship in their churches without hindrance. What they're really concerned about is another government that will come into power that will be similar to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, where they will have no rights and where they will be attacked. 
it's something that's important to the Syrian people that their country remain uh, one that is a pluralistic, secular society, uh, and frankly, one that they hope will be able to continue to be a model for countries, especially around the Middle East, uh, that uh, don't have that freedom of religion. Congresswoman Gabbard says despite all the destruction she saw, the people of Syria give her great hope for the country's future. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Very interesting. Um, what didn't come out in that interview was that uh, the Assad people are represent the Alawites, which are about 15% of the population. So you've got Sunnis and you've got Shias, but the Alawites are the same group as Saddam Hussein. They were the same small group, and um, his power base was the same as Saddam Hussein. So that's the way it is. He is trained as a, as a physician in Europe, and you can't imagine how come he's been so brutal. But mm -hmm. the, the killing and the, the, you talk about Aleppo, the, the awful stuff they've done is just horrible. And uh, they've bombed and they, they've used uh, poisonous gas on their own people. And um, I'm, I, I don't want to whitewash this guy, but we're in the horns of a dilemma. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in a worse devil than the one we've already got, and that's what everybody's afraid of. And so uh, right now, if, if Obama had moved quickly, there were some solid pro-democracy rebels who could have filled the gap had we gone in to arm them, but we didn't. We sat on our hands and let the situation deteriorate, and we, quote, led from behind, and there is one more failure of the Obama administration, and now we're, we're picking up the pieces of what was left. Well, Wendy, what you got next? Well, up next, the four foot eight gymnasts who stood tall at last summer's Olympic Games thanks some crucial, has some crucial advice from her father. Don't waste God's gift. One day I'll be too old to do gymnastics, so for now I have to use it to the best of my ability. See how one of Simone Biles' greatest failures paved the way for her greatest victory. Plus, the NBA executive recognized by the Basketball Hall of Fame reveals your secret to success. So stay with us. At the closing ceremony for the 2016 Olympics, Simone Biles was chosen to carry the American flag, and with good reason. During her two weeks in Rio, Simone wowed the world, not just with her gravity-defying gymnastic routines, but her infectious smile as well. Now, the four-time gold medalist is telling the story about how she got there and beat the odds along the way. Simone Biles won our hearts and five medals, four of them gold, at the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio. She says her time with her Olympic teammates is something she will never forget. To be part of the final five was really amazing. It's something I'll cherish in my heart forever. I mean, it's something that we'll always be connected with because we did so well at the games. And the bond that we've had, we're like sisters, so we really are good friends and we want the best for each other. So the success that we brought back to the States and shared with them was something unbelievable. Simone is the most decorated American gymnast and a four-time all-around gymnastics champion. A testament to her love of the sport that began when she was a child. I guess I love the freedom of the sport. There was no right or wrongs that you could do. They, you didn't have to have one particular body type. You made everything mold into what you were born with. So I think God gives every individual something special in mind was talent. So to never take it for granted, which my dad always told me, don't waste God's gift that he gave you because it's like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and one day I'll be too old to do gymnastics. So for now I have to use it to the best of my ability. Her journey to the top has not been easy and began with a turbulent home life. My biological mom was suffering with drugs and alcohol, I do believe, and so we were taken into foster care. And we were in foster care for a little bit until my grandparents decided to take us in. So then that's kind of when our life reformed and everything. Her grandmother, Nellie, whom Simone now calls mom, says God opened her heart to adopt Simone and her sister, Adria. It was meant to be, I mean, without 
a shadow of a doubt, nothing was supposed to be different. And it's the best decision we've ever made. Since then, Nellie has encouraged Simone to put her life and career in God's hands. I am a very prayerful person, so and I encourage uh, my children to do the same thing too, to pray. And I know it doesn't matter what situation you're ever in. Um, you just put it in the hands of the Lord and he's gonna, he's gonna walk you through it. I was taught that you can go to him for anything and he's the one that directs your life. She would always tell us if you don't know, leave it up to God, pray to him about it. Simone says she sees God's hand in her success and also in her disappointments, like the time she failed to make the 2011 team. I didn't make national team, so I was super upset about that, but I knew that it was God's way of telling me I needed to go home, train harder, so that next year I could make it happen. So I believe that some obstacles that we've had always work out for the better because God knows that without those, you wouldn't be as strong as you were. Nellie says her proudest moments have come from Simone's ability to make hard decisions and to stick by them. The fact that Simone made difficult decisions at a very early age made her a stronger person. I think the proudest moment that I had of Simone's life is her telling me she wants to go on the elite track of gymnastics to compete for her country. The little girl told me that, and she did it. In her new book, Courage to Soar, Simone shares her life story, including her struggles with body image. I didn't struggle with like weight issues. It was just more of body image um, because I didn't look like the other kids in my class. I looked more like, like the boys. I was stronger than most of the girls, stronger than most of the boys too even. Whenever I was younger, I would try to hide my muscles. So I'm like, it's not that pretty, but now I'm just like, muscles are beauty and I think people are starting, slowly starting to realize that you can be muscular and a female and be beautiful at the same time. So I think it's important for kids and gymnasts particularly to understand that because we wouldn't be able to do what we do if we didn't have the muscular body build. As she looks to the future, Simone says she will continue to give all she's got with the talent that God gave her and she encourages others to do the same. You're so young when you think of all these dreams and you're like, oh, it'll never come happen. But once you put hard work and dedication into it, you can really achieve anything. I think the mind is one of the strongest things you have. I hope before I end my career, I give all of my energy and effort and my talent towards that sport before I finally like hang up my grips and say I'm done. Simone, you're such an inspiration. And yes, your muscles are beautiful. Well, Simone tells more of her story in her new book. It's called Courage to Soar, and it's available wherever books are sold. Pat. Well, Simone Biles' success is an example of what can be achieved when someone's talent meets their passion. Basketball executive Pat Williams calls this the success intersection. And he says you don't need to be a world-class athlete to attain greatness. It's an understatement to say Pat Williams looks at the bright side of things. He's one of America's top motivational speakers and has inspired millions of people. As an NBA executive, Pat led 23 teams to the playoffs and co-founded the Orlando Magic. He's written dozens of books and still finds time to raise his 19 children. Even cancer couldn't dampen his outlook on life. In his book, The Success Intersection, Pat offers a clear roadmap to identify your greatest talent and outlines how to focus that talent on achieving your goals. Well, our good friend Pat Williams is here with us now. And Pat, it's wonderful to see you again. You are the most prolific author I know anything about. How many books have you written so far? <laughs> Pat, that's book number 104. Come on! Yeah. My high school English teacher would be stunned. Yeah. He would be shocked. But uh, this latest one, Pat, is called The Success Intersection. All right. And it's about when your greatest talent intersects okay. with your greatest passion. Uh, that is your sweet spot in life. Yeah. And that's where you want to stay. That's where you want to make your living. And that's where you want to get paid every two weeks. Right there in that sweet spot. So that's the meat of this new Was book. Was yours managing sports teams? Was that your passion? That's well, what... uh, Pat, I saw my first Major League Baseball game when I was seven years old. My dad took me to the ballpark in uh -huh. Philadelphia. 
June 15th, 1947, remember it vividly, uh, the A's and the Indians in a doubleheader, and I was absolutely riveted by the sights and the sound mm. and the smell and the color of baseball. Yeah. I woke up the next morning as a seven-year-old, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a ball player. Really? And so through high school and college and uh -huh. into, the, into the pro ranks with the Phillies, my roots are in baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I was living uh, right there in that intersection. Now, my talent as a ball player wasn't good enough, uh -huh. but I, uh, the Phillies gave me a chance in the front office and that seemed to be my niche. Mm -hmm. I switched over to the National Basketball Association when I was 28 years old and have been now almost 50 years in the NBA, Pat. So I've been living right there in that intersection of, of talent and passion. And that's what uh, I'm encouraging people with this book to do, and particularly young people. Give me some, I know you'll have uh, anecdotes in here. Give me a few of them in the book. Well, Pat, the best anecdote I've got came after the book was written. Mm -hmm. uh, my son Bobby, uh, who's in baseball for his career, uh, he has twin boys. Uh -huh. uh, they're four years old now. Teddy, little Teddy. Yeah. From the time he was two years old, wants to swing that bat and hit a ball. Mm -hmm. And so they've got him signed up for T-ball really? at four. Starts yeah. this weekend in Sarasota, Florida. His twin brother, Jack, mm -hmm. could not care less really? about swinging a bat. He mm -hmm. likes to entertain. And he likes to make up stories. Yeah. And he likes to act. And so they've got him ready to go in the uh, theater world what a uh, come this fall. So that's the point. Parents, grandparents, teachers, and coaches, mm -hmm. we need to be on the alert, constantly looking to see what talent our youngsters have and then nurturing it and feeding it and fueling it. So, so uh, many, that's a big part of it, too. So many people try to force that talent into a, in an avenue it's not intended to go. Good they? point, Pat. And I yeah. think God gives us special gifts. We come down on this earth mm -hmm. with, I think, red threads yeah. coursing through our, uh, our blood system. Mm -hmm. and, and those are talents. Those red threads indicate talent or interests. And, and so as parents and teachers and coaches, we need to inflame those red threads and really ignite them so that young people can really carry on and live meaningful lives where their talent and their passion meet. But this really is, is success, isn't it? To do that which God made you for. That's what it amounts to is fulfilling what, you know, that, that whole idea of the pursuit of happiness, that's really what that means, doesn't it? It's, well, it's, Pat, when they talk about God's will, yeah. uh, and, and everybody that I've, every Christian I've ever met, it, what is God's will for my life? Well, I think practically it is, well, what are you good at? Yeah. yeah. What is your talent? Uh, what, what, and then secondly, what do you love to do? Mm -hmm. What are you excited about? What are you enthused about? You can't fake enthusiasm, Pat. It's got to be genuine. But, so talent and passion are the but keys that's here. That's what God made you for, so you don't have to go looking for some elusive will in the sky. It's, there you it's, go. It's inside of you. Pat, that's it. And and uh, and we need help, as particularly as young people. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be encouraged. We need to be uplifted. One word, Pat. One word of encouragement from a teacher, for example, yeah. with a fifth grade student, and she says to a young lady, uh, Elizabeth, I, I see writing talent with you. I think, I think you're a marvelous writer. Mm -hmm. Or, or a, a teacher in the eighth grade says to a, a young man, you know, I see leadership potential in you, Jack. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really lead in this classroom. I, listen, those words, Pat, mm -hmm. never leave us. And, and they're going to uplift. And so we constantly need to be encouraging people and, yes. uh, and spotting talent and telling them that. I see a bright future for you, son, or yeah, you've got great potential. That's important. Well, you find parents that run their children down. You know, you're stupid. You can't make it kind yeah. of thing. It did not breaks your heart, doesn't it? All that talent going to waste. And, Pat, that comes back to the power of our words. Yes. The power of the tongue. Uh, I remember, Pat, every single word mm -hmm. that every teacher and every coach. Wow. And my parents, I remember, I think, just about everything that was ever said to me. When you really sit down and think about it, most people can recall those words. So mm -hmm. it is awfully important that we speak words of hope and encouragement and uplift people and encourage people. And we, we get into all of those different topics, Pat, in this new book. It sounds fascinating. 
We had a good time putting it together. Mm -hmm. I, I share a lot of stories and anecdotes yeah. uh, from my life and my career and things that happened to me, and plus many, many others. The success intersection, remember that little formula when your greatest talent mm -hmm. intersects with your strongest passion. Well, that's the sweet spot in your life, and that's where you want to live, that's where you want to get educated, and that's where you want to get paid every two weeks, mm -hmm. and that's what you want to be doing. I think you're a living example of that, aren't you, Pat? I am. You know, years ago when I was a little fellow, my, my mother said, you know, you're a leader. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm a little kid. Said, what are you talking about? Who am I going to lead? Well, and I was a chubby little boy. But, you know, as it goes But something along, struck, right? Something yeah, stayed all there. Away. And it was never put down, always lift up. I had parents like that. They want to encourage you. You know, you, you're, this is your destiny. And I, I think for parents to do what you say, um, Pat, it's just fabulous. Well, I know this book is going to bless people. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you couldn't ask for anything better. The success intersection. Pat has hit the sweet spot as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> You've got it, buddy. God bless you. You were fighting cancer. You, you, you're a survivor. What did you have? Pat, I was diagnosed uh, over six years ago with multiple myeloma, mm. which came. They've discovered it just in my yearly physical. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and if I could just say this, do not neglect your yearly physical, folks, mm -hmm. because if there is something going on in your body, yeah. you know, you want to find out early. So they discovered that there was something in my blood work mm -hmm. that wasn't right. And uh, that led to the discovery of multiple myeloma. I'd never heard of it, mm -hmm. but it's one of the blood cancers. Yeah. And so they've been uh, treating me for all these years. I'm into the seventh year now. Are you and still being treated for it? Well, I take an oral chemo. Really? Uh, 21 days on, seven days off. Dear but the doctors man. are telling me that they don't really see any signs of it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like uh, at this point, uh, I'm living cancer free. So well, you have to fight that chemo, though, don't you? Is it drag you down? Well, I get. Uh, I think the only thing I've noticed is I, mm -hmm. I sleep a lot longer than I used to. Well, nothing wrong with that. But nothing wrong with that, Pat. <laughs> right. Pat Williams, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great author, one of the m most prolific authors in America, a great coach, a great uh, uh, manager of teams, basketball, baseball, a wonderful friend. Pat Williams. God bless you. I'm so glad to Pat, see you. Pat, I'm always happy to see you, sir, and I'm glad you're Thank doing you. well. I couldn't be better. I'm coming up on 87, brother. I'm getting there, going for good, 100. Good for you. Let's do it. Let's do it together. <laughs> How many have you got? I'm, I'm uh, 76 right now. I'll be 77 in May, Pat. Okay. You've got me by about 10 years. 10 years, and I'm going strong. We're both going strong. <laughs> Over the way we go. And here's Wendy. Uh, our French scholar who went to school in France. Really? <laughs> yeah. Say, oui. <laughs> Fink. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Well, I should say merci, Pat and Pat. All right. Well, still ahead, we'll put our host on the hot seat for another round of Bring It On. Serena says, my husband doesn't help out with household chores or expenses. I do it all, including Carrie, caring for our adult disabled son. Is this grounds for divorce in God's eyes? Your email questions are coming up later, so don't go away. And welcome back to the 700 Club. At least six tornadoes tore through central Texas Monday, ripping roofs from homes and damaging dozens of others. San Antonio was hit the hardest with about 150 buildings damaged. No deaths or major injuries were reported, but there were plenty of close calls. Like a sonic boom. By the time I realized it was a tornado, our roof was disappeared on us. It just completely vanished. All of a sudden my, my window just like shot in. Everything just fell apart in like a matter of like two or three seconds. One tornado bent this high voltage transmission tower in northeastern San Antonio completely in half. Power was knocked out for nearly 50,000 customers, but that has now mostly been restored. California is getting hit hard with more wind and rain today. Forecasters issuing flash flood warnings across the San Francisco Bay Area and Northern California. Creeks and rivers are already swollen from heavy rains. Some areas were evacuated after a levee breach, but there is some good news as well. Water levels are falling at the Oroville Dam, where a damaged spillway had prompted officials to evacuate 190,000 people. Five people were killed by the storm over the weekend. About half of the 
state has been under flood, wind and snow advisories. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Well, in China, one woman and her young granddaughter worked all day selling potatoes. On a good day, they earned $4. On a bad day, they starved. When Jiali's father died and her mother abandoned her, Grandma Sue set out to provide Jiali with the best life she could. I wanted Jiali to go to school. I didn't want her to suffer like me. For years, she sold potatoes at a tourist attraction on the top of a mountain. Sometimes, Jiali went too. It took almost an hour to get there, and Grandma got weaker every day. The long walk hurt her back and her legs. It was a good day if they made four dollars. Many times, I did not sell even one potato and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, worrying that the next day would be the same. At this rate, Jiali couldn't stay in school or eat a balanced diet. No. I felt guilty she got dizzy a lot. I didn't have money to bring her to the doctor or get her medicine. It was so stressful that I wanted to commit suicide. But I knew if I did, my granddaughter would suffer even more. Meanwhile, Jiali worried about her grandmother, especially after they got caught in a bad rainstorm on the way to work. We were shivering like two drenched sheep. We sold potatoes anyway, but Grandma got really sick. She was in bed and couldn't walk. They didn't have enough firewood to keep the house warm and couldn't afford coal, so Grandma Sue got worse. I was afraid she would die. What would I do without her? <laughs> Grandma Sue is a Christian, so she asked God to heal her and improve her life. Soon she recovered and met a representative from CBN. We paid for some of Jiali's school fees and provided her with nutritious food. We stocked their home with coal so they'd be warm in the winter. And we helped Grandma Sue start a livestock business. CBN bought cows for us so we can breed them and sell them for money. Now my grandma won't have to carry heavy things on her back. Jali will be able to finish school. I moved that God would love me so much that he would bring you nice people from so far away to help me. Words cannot express my happiness. Mm. We are so blessed here in this country, aren't we? And, you know, to see how they're just basically getting by on $4 a day, some days, some days, nothing. You know, it's amazing uh, what we can do when we all partner together. If you are a CBM partner, you helped that grandmother. You helped her and you helped bring that cow so that they don't have to worry about, you know, living on potatoes every day. And if you'd like to be a part of helping people all over the world, it's so easy to do that. We make it easy for you by just going to your phones, 1-800-700-7000 and saying, yes, I would like to join the 700 Club. How much is it? Just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBM partner. And you can do so much to help so many. When you do that, we have a gift for you, a very special DVD, The Secret Kingdom and the Law of Expectation. Pat and Gordon have put this together and this is a phenomenal teaching. It's really a life-changing teaching that uh, you will want to share with your family and friends. So this is our gift when you give us a call right now. And we'll be right back with some email questions. Glenn says, 12 years ago, my wife and I built a beautiful home. Now she's not content and she wants a new home. It's causing tension between us. How do I make her happy? Pat will answer that and more when we return. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. 
Welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time to bring it on with your email questions, and Pat is in the hot seat. Glenn says, 12 years ago, my wife and I built a beautiful new home on eight acres of land that the Lord blessed us with. It's peaceful and quiet. My wife loves to watch all of the home renovation shows displaying the newest ideas in home design. She now wants a new home with new features and is out looking at new homes on her own without my blessing. She is not content. It's bringing a lot of tension into our marriage because I believe we need to stay where we are. I've even offered to do some renovations to our current home, but that does not satisfy her. What can I do to make her happy? Well, uh I wouldn't worry so much about making her happy, but what you've got to do to make yourself happy is assert yourself as a husband and say, listen, I'm the head of the household, and the answer to this thing is no, now stop it. You know, this woman has got deep-seated psychological issues, and she thinks she can fulfill them by material possessions, and no amount of material possessions can ever make anybody happy. You can have a bigger car, you can have a bigger house, you can have a bigger yacht, you can have a bigger income. You can have a whole lot of toys, and none of them will make you happy. There's only one thing that will make you happy, and that is Jesus. And what she needs is to have a close relationship with Jesus where she dies and he comes alive. And <clears throat> it's spiritual I'm talking about. I mean, you know, you, you die to self and you come alive to him. Then you'll know satisfaction. But be a husband and say, no, wife, I am the head of the household, and this is it. You know, that, that, that's one of the problems in our marriages today, that there's no order. There's supposed to be order. And I know women don't like to hear this, but in the Bible, the husband is the head of the household. Just the way it is, you can't have two heads, and when you do, you've got fighting all the time. All right, what else you, you got? You know, but I appreciate that he wanted to, com he wanted to say, I'll, I'll make some renovations, but she didn't want that, no, so. It's not a renovation. You yeah. can't, there's nothing you can do to a house to make somebody happy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right, Serena writes, my husband and I have been married for 21 years, but have been together for 28. We have two children, ages 26 and 25. Our 25-year-old son is autistic and mentally disabled and needs constant care. I alone care for our son. My husband does not work or help in any way. I struggle to make ends meet. My husband also has a slight drug problem. If, if he does do an odd job, he won't help with household expenses or food, but he will eat the food that I struggle to bring into the house. Is this grounds for divorce in God's eyes? I struggle with the idea of divorce because I was brought up to believe that divorce is wrong, but I don't know how much more I can take. Well, the first thing is you were living together without being married and you were having kids and then you got married, okay. Uh, I think, in my opinion, what you're looking about is constructive desertion. Your husband essentially has deserted out of the home. He's not carrying any load. He's make, making you carry the load, and it's too much for you, and it's not fair. It's constructive desertion. Now, you don't necessarily have to get a divorce, but you could get a decree uh, of, of separation, because I suspect you're the principal breadwinner just you want to get his hands off your money, and that's what will happen. I know this sounds hard, but, uh, you know, you just can't live. It's an intolerable situation that you're in now. And I would say constructive desertion. He has essentially left you, even though he's still staying in the house. I totally agree. Thank All you, right. Pat. All right, William says, I'm disabled and can't travel like everyone else. My wife wants to go to a concert by herself in a city where there's been at least one shooting a night since January 1st. I asked her not to go because I'm worried for her safety, but she said she's going anyway. Other than prayer, what can I do? What you can do is say yes. The other guy said say no. This one you say yes. She wants to go to the concert, let her go to the concert. So she gets shot, tough luck. You know, it's her life. You know, so I'm sorry, dear. You just got shot. You asked for it. But, but what about being head of the household and just putting his foot down? Being head of the household means you've got to give freedom to the members of the household to do what they want to do. Right. And she wants to go to a concert. You're disabled. You can't make it. So enjoy. Say, look, you enjoy. I'll pray that the Lord will protect you. And uh, she'll be all right. You've got an unnatural fear. She's not going to get shot. <laughs> I mean, how many people get shot in the city percentage-wise? Hardly any. Yeah. And so don't worry about it. Say, dear, I'm giving you into God's hands. You want to go, go with my blessing. What can I do? Make it easy on yourself. Amen. Okay. I like okay. that. You like that? <laughs> I like that answer. Okay. All right. Okay. Starla says, do you, I like all of his answers. All right. All right. Starla says, do you believe everyone who says the sinner's prayer is saved? 
I know the Bible tells us if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts the Lord Jesus Christ, we will, we shall be saved. Do you believe this is salvation? Uh, there's got to be a question of repentance. Just saying a, saying a bunch of words doesn't get you saved. You have to give your heart to the Lord. There has to be a commitment to Jesus. And so when you confess him, it means that I am making you Lord of my life, and it's got to be a commitment, not just saying a bunch of words. Words won't do it. It's got to be a commitment from the heart. Well, thanks for being with us. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Proverbs. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. For with you and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow on the 700 Club.